I am Mary Claire Speckner, also with the library and also on board, as you already met, with Stephanie Merrifield. And tonight's program is Landscaping with Native Plants, and it's sponsored by the South Central Indiana Master Gardener Association. Our presenter is Jason Larson, and Jason is a regional ecologist for the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, Nature Preserves. Jason has worked with native plants, preservation and restoration of natural areas for 15 years and has several native plant gardens at home. If you have questions during the event, just go ahead and type them in the chat. Uh, Jason will take the questions during the program or at the end, it's up to you. And also tomorrow you're gonna to receive a short survey via email and would be greatly appreciated if you could fill out the survey, right, Cora? Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, it's gonna help Purdue and the Master Gardeners with future programs and it's anonymous. You don't have to give your name or anything like that. So over to you, Jason. And thanks everybody for being here tonight. Thanks very much for having me out tonight. It's, uh, it's kind of fun to do a meeting where I don't have to drive uh, a couple hours. So um, yeah, I guess I'll share my screen here and get started with a, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, before I pull that up though, I'll just give you a little bit of background on me. So. My job with the Division of Nature Preserves is basically kind of a, a property steward. So I've got 20 counties in Southern Indiana that I take care of all the nature preserves in those counties. So it's about 30 different properties and I take care of the trails and do restorations and uh, all, all sorts of fun stuff like that, prescribed fire. Um, and so I, like she said, I've been doing uh, landscape restoration and, and native plant work for about 15 years now, but um, my dirty secret that I'm going to tell you guys about tonight is that I was also part of the landscape trade and the uh, the nursery trade. Uh, so I've planted and sold uh, hundreds and hundreds of invasive plants over the years. So I'm kind of doing my penance for that now. Um, so I've kind of seen both sides of it and, and watched it change over the years. Uh, Okay, can everybody see that okay? Yeah, looks good. Okay, good deal. So this is one of my uh, little native plant plantings uh, from a house I, we moved away from a couple of years ago. Um, and you can see that there's some, whoops, you can see there's some non-natives mixed in there too, but just an idea of, um, you know, native plantings can be uh, very colorful and, um, you know, not necessarily totally wild looking. Uh, so I'll start out with a quote from Micah Moya, who said, indigenous plants, which are the plants that are native to Indiana, are a significant part of a region's geographic context and they help define it. They have proven themselves capable of surviving the landscape for millennia. What better plants can there be, if not the natives, to confront the soil conditions, climate, pests, and diseases of the local areas? So to me, that, that kind of sums up the, the reasons why, um, why natives are, are super, good and super easy plants to landscape with. Okay, so there tends to be a little bit of confusion on what exactly is a native and non-native plant. So I'll go over some terms here at the beginning. Uh, so native plant, we just basically define it as a species that was here prior to European settlement. Um, so the stuff that's been here uh, 200 years um, and before that, and then Non-native plant would be um, anything that, that hasn't been here um, since pre-settlement times, um, but it's not spreading aggressively or causing harm. Um, and so if we were to add up all the plants in Indiana, if you were to go out and add them all up and make a big list, you'd get about 2,700 plants approximately. And about three quarters, three quarters of those are native plants and the, the additional 25% are non-native. And most of those non-native plants um, are not an issue. But there's a small percentage of non-native plants that become invasive. Um, so an invasive plant is something that escapes from cultivation. Uh, not only does it escape, but it spreads widely and it displaces native plants. Uh, and it also causes ecological and economic harm. So if it fits all those categories, so basically it's just something that gets loose and takes over. Um, and then since we're talking about gardening, we kind of have another category here, the aggressive plant. Sometimes, you know, if you have a, a plant that's aggressive in your garden, um, you know, something that reseeds every year and you've got to keep on weeding it and weeding it, we call it invasive, even though it's not really, you know, technically invasive plant. So 
we'll call those aggressive plants. That they, they kind of are disturbance oriented and they take over in these areas that get dug up and cultivated all the time. So my background slide here is a, a little scene from Jennings County. We've got our native bluebells on the, uh, on the river swale there with a big old nice American beech tree. Okay, so we look at what kind of what traditional landscaping is. Um, kind of the, it's, it's basically what we expect to see when we drive through a suburb or a neighborhood. And there's not a whole lot of different species. Generally, there's a lot of open space, a lot of mowed fescue in the yard. Um, and it's very resource in intensive to keep it looking nice. It's estimated that over 67 billion pounds of fertilizers are used a year by homeowners. And then the average person spends about 40 hours a year mowing um, and requires heavy water. And if you want it to look, it's absolute uh, nicest. Um, we like to say that a traditional landscaping is kind of a biological desert. Um, there's not very many species and there are a lot of them are not native to um, where they're growing. So the plants that are growing there don't have uh, insects that are naturally eating them. And, and then the the other animals that control the insects. So there's not really uh, a web of interactions between the animals that are there. You might see pollinators, you might see, uh, you know, squirrels running through the yard, but there's not a, not a really great um, niche for wildlife and all that. But it does meet kind of our cultural expectations of having a, you know, this kind of standard clean look and it, it's kind of what we expect to see. So we're going to look at native plant gardening in kind of a unique context in that it's, um, whoops, backwards here. So it's kind of, uh, you can look at native gardening like it's, a, um, it's one of the better things you can do for conservation. Um, even, you know, even if you don't, uh, weren't wild about, you know, all the new varieties and whatever of this or that, um, native plants have a lot to offer for your, for your garden. So you've got natural food sources for birds and wildlife, uh, things that they're looking for naturally already in the woods and the prairies they can find in your yard. There's habitat connectivity. Instead of just having acres and acres of yawn, uh, <laughs> lawn in a subdivision, uh, you can have connectivity of these patches of uh, native plants that um, give the butterflies and birds somewhere where they can have choices to where to go and uh, connect um, travel patterns and things like that. We can conserve local plants. So I know of an example where uh, one of the nurseries in Northern Indiana um, raised some plants for us. And we had a, a, a seed in the mix for a plant uh, called Royal Catchfly, which is a really a pretty rare plant in Southern Indiana. Um, and now that plant is raised and sold um, by that nursery all over the state and it's in landscaping all over the place. I run into people who have it in their yard now and it's just, it's from a, a, a little roadside plant that was growing down in Washington County. Um, so really growing native plants can, can really help preserve these local, local genotypes, very specialized plants that um, otherwise, you know, that plant could have just gotten mowed and never, never would have come back again. Having less um, mowed yard in our lawns makes for less uh, runoff, less water runoff. The mowed yard doesn't, doesn't uh, accept, uh, doesn't, the water doesn't percolate it down through the soil as well as it does in a, a native plant planting. Um, and then we have that, that working ecosystem. We have that active food web where we have host plants for moths and butterflies. Um, a lot of times moths and butterflies and birds have particular plants that they need. Um, like moths and butterflies need very particular host plants. And if they don't have those plants, they won't be around. So by providing those plants, you can give uh, can have an opportunity to see those uh, insects or, or butterflies or whatever it is. <clears throat> so the biggest question is kind of how do how do I get started? And it kind of it's basically just like any other type of gardening, right? You want to try to figure out where you want your garden. Uh, what spots do you have open and look at what the sun conditions are and what the soil conditions are. Um, so you're, you're basically picking out, um, you know, is this part sun, full sun, full shade, 
and then looking to see you know how much soil moisture there is. And then since we're doing native gardening, we can kind of match that to habitat type. So the habitat types we would normally see in Indiana, we can kind of look at those and pick you know what kind of environment our yard closely matches. And I'll I'll get into that in a couple slides here. And then I think it's really good to have a goal in mind before you just before you just start going out and buying uh, plants, <laughs> as some of us tend to do. Um, so think about whether you whether your goal is to have more wildlife in your yard, whether you want birds, pollinators, if you're really into you know prairie plants or you just want to mow a lot less. Um, frame your goals all around that so you can kind of be focused on what you're doing. And then the next step is to, to choose a source. And this is kind of the hardest part. Um, there's a lot more uh, suppliers of native plants now than there ever have been before, but they're not very, uh, um, they're not very abundant. You usually have to drive somewhere or pay some shipping uh, in order to get them to your front door. So, uh, and, and my number one piece of advice is to try to avoid uh, the so-called wildflower seed packets. Um, in my experience, even from kind of well-meaning federal organizations and uh, SWCD, Soil and Water Conservation District type groups, they tend to be um, not the best choice. Not a, you know, they have a lot of annuals in them that aren't going to come back the next year, and a lot of non-natives uh, are found in those a lot of times. So if, if you're looking at those, at least be sure to check what the, what the species list is on that and check it out. And then just kind of like any other gardening, again, you have to decide whether you want to do seeds or plugs or plants. Um, and I, as far as I've seen, it seems like plugs and plants is kind of the, where, the, where the growers are at most of the time. That's if you're buying native plants, you're usually buying plants. Um, but there are some seed choices out there, but I don't think they're usually as local. And then just kind of the basics of landscaping, you know, trying to plan how to lay out the plants once you have an idea what you what you want to uh, have in the ground. So kind of the idea of having the tallest in the back or in the middle if you have an island. And then planning for seasonal changes, you know, be thinking about what's going to be blooming in the spring, make sure you're going to have something blooming after that in the summer and then in the fall. And then I'd say the biggest mistake people make with not just with native landscaping, but with landscaping in general is uh, <clears throat> they, they try to make it look um, nice and full in the beginning. And you really want, um, you want to leave room for all those plants to fill in and grow. They're all going to get tall. They're all going to fill in. And if you put, if you put everything kind of too dense at first, it's going to be uh, just a big mess later. So keep that in mind. If it looks a little skinny the first couple of years, that's okay. Okay. So I was talking about kind of what our goals are. Um, so one of the goals you could set is you could say, um, you know, if you live in an older uh, subdivision or older house and you have some big trees around a really shady yard, you could say you wanted to emulate uh, kind of a regular uh, woodland garden where you have, uh, you know, mostly a tree and shrub overstory, but there's spring ephemerals around. Or you could, you could say, you know, if you have a little more sunlight, you could, you could try to do more of an open woods or glady type idea where you have a, a more open forest um, that's going to be more more sunlight, you can have a lot more uh, wildflowers in there even into the summertime. <clears throat> then obviously if you have uh, some water on the property, you could have wetlands. And um, if you're into the idea of having a, a pollinators or just prairie plants around, you can obviously have that as a goal well. Just keep in mind that if you look at the state of Indiana here, hopefully you guys can see my mouse moving around the screen. Almost everywhere in Indiana wants to be forest. So wherever you plant anything, whether it's a prairie or a garden or whatever, we all know that eventually it's going to want to turn to trees. So we have to weed the gardens. We, if we have a big prairie planting, you have to keep it mowed and uh, basically do that, do that maintenance to keep it from becoming forest. So if you, uh, if you already have a woods or want to plant a woods, you're a step ahead of the game because that's what everything kind of wants to be anyway. Unless you're up here in this prairie region in the sandy Northwest. <clears throat> so if you're just kind of wanting to dip your toe in the water <clears throat> and don't want to put a big, you know, portion of your budget or a whole bunch of time into 
native landscaping yet. You can, there's a couple of ways you can kind of ease into it, so to speak, or ease your neighbors into you getting into it, get them used to seeing some plants around that they haven't seen before. The, the easiest is would be, a, of course, a container garden where you just take a whiskey barrel or a, a big pot and fill it with some native plants you might you think you might like. Um, and so the advantage of this is that you don't have a big commitment of your yard or resources, you know, it's cheap. Um, the disadvantage is you've got to keep it watered in the summertime. The containers do take a, a lot of attention as far as watering goes compared to ground plantings. <clears throat> And then the other one that's really easy is a mailbox garden. This is a good, always a good place to start. You know, you see it every day when you drive in and out of your driveway, if you still drive out of your driveway every day. Um, but it's a, it's a good small garden that you don't have to spend, you don't have to buy, you know, 100 plants to put one in. You can buy a couple plants and, and kind of plant it out and uh, have some fun with it, but not get too involved. And then another neat one I really like that I learned about recently is kind of this idea of a downspout garden. You can uh, kind of do a French drain type deal instead of the, the regular plastic downspout diversion um, where the water splashes from the downspout onto some stones and you have a kind of a little trough there where the water gathers and you have a little divot in the yard where you can kind of do a, a rain garden type thing where you have more uh, plants that enjoy a little bit more moisture like lobelias and uh, things like that, some sedges. Uh, you could have lots of choices. You can In this one, I. Looks like they've got Joe Pie weed back here and then some more wetland oriented stuff around where the water actually is. So there's a couple of really good ways to just kind of get started and and you know not spend too much time on it. So when we when we think about doing native landscaping, kind of at least in my mind, I think like I think about kind of a big wild prairie garden that, that you know not necessarily wouldn't be part of a suburban uh, yard, but that's not necessarily the case. You can do a, a native landscape project that looks just like a regular yard, of course. Um, so there's different looks we can kind of go for is, is what I'm getting at there and kind of levels of commitment. Um, so level one to me would be just taking, looking at your yard and number one is looking at uh, what you have that's invasive. If you have invasive shrubs that are growing around already, Put those first on your list to, to yank those out and replace those with some native ones. Um, so just kind of slowly replacing what you have now with native plants is a, is a really easy um, way to get natives into your landscape, uh, get that connectivity again, uh, but not change the look of your yard too much. Another one I really like um, <clears throat> is putting up a privacy hedge with some evergreens, um, you know, whether that's red cedar or um, winterberry and, and putting some showy uh, native plants underneath that. So you just kind of have that look of a privacy hedge. It's not uh, not too crazy, but you can, you can kind of landscape around that privacy hedge and expand that into a garden as you like. Whoops, lost here. And then it'd be kind of expanding beyond the idea of just having quote unquote regular landscaping where you have, you know, some some gardens just around the front of your house. You can do borders, uh, what I call border gardens or island gardens, where you have a garden along a fence or along your front porch or an island kind of in the, in the middle of your backyard, something like that. <clears throat> and then kind of, this is usually something people work towards as they put in more and more gardens, depending on, you know, if you're just trying uh, to mow less and less or if you just are enjoying the native plants being around kind of what I call the native takeover where your whole yard just kind of becomes, um, maybe your whole backyard becomes a whole, a big native plant garden. That's a, a prairie or several different types of gardens uh, with kind of just some paths going through it up to your property boundaries. Um, I can't see, are we having any questions in the chat at all? No, not yet. Okay, good deal. If anybody has any questions or anything's not clear, feel free to Put a question in the chat for me. So this is the photo from the from the title slide. Um, and this would be an example of a, just a, a, a native garden you could put uh, along any border, so to speak, in your yard. So along a fence line, front porch or whatever, just kind of a couple of curved um, spaces that don't have to take up a whole lot of room if you don't want them to. 
you know, depending on how much you want to mulch and, and weed and all that. But you can see we've got some, looks like Joe Pye weed here, some Leatris, we've got uh, bee balm down here on the right. We've got some non-native lambsy are grown here underneath, just kind of whatever we had in the garden beforehand. We've got a, a bunch of different varieties of purple cone flower here, some different native ours, so to speak. And we'll talk about those in a minute, but butterfly weed and then swamp milkweed. So they can be, you know, really colorful and um, they can look pretty nice. Uh, we did get, um, <clears throat> excuse me, just a couple questions in just now. Um, what are some of your favorite native shrubs? I have a place on the south side of my house that could use a large shrub. It's shady area with a mature maple near it. Okay, um, I will get to some of my favorite um, favorite plants, uh, shrubs particularly, a little bit later in the talk. So we'll leave that for a few minutes here. I'll, I'll get around to that in a little bit though. All right, and then the other one <clears throat> just says source for the royal catch fly. Okay, that's kind of a tricky one. Um, it, so it was, I believe it was grown by Spence Nursery, but Spence does not do uh, retail sales regularly, but they do supply plants for many, many organizations who do re retail sales. Like if you have a, if your SWCD group has a <clears throat> native plant sale or, you know, I'd say probably 80% of the native plant sales, they're supplying the, the plugs and plants for those. So if you see Royal Catchfly at a native plant sale, it's it's probably from from there, um, but I, I don't have a, unfortunately a place where I can just send you to a, a retail place to buy it. Unfortunately, but chances are good that you'll come across it if you if you were looking at at native plant sales in Indiana. Prairie Moon carries it, as does Prairie Nursery. Okay, there you go. That's it for questions right now. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I actually just, I got this, uh, this little picture here, um, uh, just last night, there was a post on the Indiana Native Plant Society webpage about this free publication. Um, and I think you guys should all check this out. It's, a uh, maybe like a 20 page PDF and it's called Native Plants for the Small Yard and it's free. If you, so if you just Google Native Plants for the Small Yard by Kate Brandes, B-R-A-N-D-E-S, uh, it'll pop right up. It's uh, from the Lehigh Gap Nature Center in Pennsylvania. Uh, it would be an excellent place to start if you're interested in designing some gardens. There's design ideas. Um, although their native plants don't overlap exactly with what's native in Indiana, some excellent starting places um, as to what plants to put where within the design and, and some different ideas. So uh, I would highly recommend checking that out. But a different garden type that you could try would be a, a corner garden. Again, you can kind of tuck it into any place where you have a corner, either of your house and a fence or the back corner of your yard, any place like that. Um, put the tall stuff in the back, um, shorter stuff in the front, some shrubs in the middle, maybe a, a showy flowering tree in the middle and you have a really neat, neat little garden. Um, that's not really gonna be in the way, so to speak. So this is kind of a pathetic picture of, of my backyard in my last house. These, these gardens actually filled in really nicely, but I wanted to show you guys what, how sparse these gardens can look in the beginning before they kind of bloom into a really nice looking garden. So if you can ignore the plastic children's toys in the back there. Uh, so these are a couple prairie gardens. Uh, if you look at it from above, it's actually kind of shaped like a butterfly. Uh, but the centerpieces of the gardens were kind of uh, some milkweed plants and uh, some elderberry bushes. Uh, I really like using elderberries in the native landscaping. They bring a lot of birds and they're super easy to grow. And then in the back, you can kind of see the idea of a corner garden. This uh, tree line back here is one of our boundaries. And then we have a fence. So this kind of this corner garden and we, we turn that into a, a native shade garden along with some hostas and stuff in there. So I, I didn't really have any great pictures of uh, my own landscaping uh, very much, but I tried to put a couple in here. Um, but especially for a backyard, um, native garden project is kind of neat to have, um, the islands. And then as you kind of grow your gardens, you can kind of connect them together or put paths through them and whatnot. So it's an idea that I, I like, uh, be aware though, that if you, 
if you start making some bigger gardens and some kind of wild looking gardens, a lot of places uh, that, that we live do have kind of rules about what our yards are supposed to look like. Um, so if your yard starts looking a little hairy and, and your neighbors don't quite understand, uh, you might have some explaining to do, so to speak. So we, we kind of have to do some education with our neighbors. So if, if you do have trouble with uh, local ordinances or covenants, things like that, um, you know, you can try to try to get ahead of that by just trying to match what your neighbors have or, you know, doing projects in your backyard or, uh, you know, putting up privacy fences and stuff like that. But just talking to your neighbors about what you're doing, tell them about native plants that you're trying to get pollinators and wildlife in your yard. And they, they usually will appreciate that if you talk to them. But then another thing that I like to encourage is um, there's a couple different ways to get your yard certified, so to speak. I think the National Wildlife Foundation still does this. And I, I believe uh, Indiana Native Plant Society does. They have this sign here that's on the slide. So you can get your yard certified and they'll send you a sign. Um, put up the signs. I mean, it's there's something that I call the interpretation effect. You can have almost anything in the world. You put a sign in front of it and all of a sudden it's interesting instead of being uh, weird. So we're used to seeing uh, interpretive signs at state parks and the Grand Canyon and things like that. So if we see a sign, we assume like, hey, this thing's kind of neat, whatever it is. So if you've got a prairie garden in your front yard that uh, the neighbors are unsure about, if there's a sign there, they'll kind of be, <laughs> they'll be comforted that it's, oh, it's official. You know, this is, this is an okay thing. Uh, so that's kind of my thoughts on that. Okay, so a few minutes ago, I mentioned native R's. So what a native R is, if you don't know, is just a cultivar of a particular native species. So just like there's cultivars of all our regular garden species, we have cultivars of natives and we just call them native R's. So the picture here on the slide is a purple coneflower native R. <clears throat> and I forget the name of this one, but it's, you can basically tell you're buying a native R because it'll have an, what I call a marketing name. It'll be like super double stuff razzmatazz or it'll have someone's name in the, in the title instead of just being, um, you know, Harry Goldenrod. Um, and in some cases they do differ in important ways from the species that they are derived from. Um, so for example, these coneflowers, <clears throat> this variety that's on the slide, uh, pollinators can't reach the nectar very easily. So if you're, if you're wanting to have a pollinator garden, you know, maybe this plant wouldn't be the, be the best choice. Um, so if you're choosing, choosing plants, just be aware that these things are out there. You know, I've had many native R, native R's in my garden and uh, you just have to be aware that sometimes there are differences. And obviously if you're doing a, a restoration, like let's say you uh, live, in, live in Southern Indiana buy some, you know, glady areas and you have open woods and you're doing more of a restoration than a decorative planting. You're trying to make it like it was originally, probably would want to use native R's to be, uh, you know, want to be authentic as possible and try to use more local genotype stuff. But it's kind of, to me, that's just a personal decision on what you like. And if you want to throw a couple native R's in there to make things interesting and look neat and something you like, then um, I say go for it. Um, so where do we get plants? Uh, we had a, a pretty good discussion kind of as the, uh, as this was starting over or where to get plants nowadays. Um, I'm assuming there's not going to be a lot of uh, in-person plant sales. I got a lot of my plants, native plants over the years at the Wings Over Muscatatuck Festival, which is every spring at Muscatatuck National Wildlife Refuge. Usually the SWCDs, I know Knox County, Dearborn County, several of them have native plant sales. Um, as well as the Indiana Native Plant Society has a native plant sale. Then these are all high quality local genotype um, native plant that, that you can uh, you know, trust the source of and uh, know that you're getting good local stuff. So I guess my advice is just keep your ear to the ground. You know, if you're a, if you're a social media person, keep your eye on the Indiana Native Plant Society Facebook page or whatever, whoever it is you follow, and just keep an eye out for those local native plant sales. They seem to pop up pretty frequently in the springtime and, and throughout the summer. Um, 
but usually if you want native plants that are more local, you're going to have to get in the car and drive, or like I said, pay some shipping. Um, and if you go over to the Indiana Native Plant Society webpage, um, they had, they curate a list of people that grow native plants and they tell you what percentage native plants they sell, you know, of their stock and kind of where their stock comes from. So I just pulled a couple, a couple places off there kind of randomly. So Valonia Tree Nursery in Valonia, Indiana, kind of down by Brownstown, south of Seymour, has, it's all native trees and shrubs. It's a state run nursery. Um, they have kind of an ordering season and a pickup season. You basically buy uh, dormant trees and shrubs rolled up in cardboard and you go pick those up early spring and uh, plant them in the ground and they, they sprout. So that's a, that's a really easy way to get a, a, a big variety. You can order variety packs, you can order particular trees or shrubs uh, individually, but I think you have to buy a certain quantity. And then there's a place called Woody Warehouse that I've heard, heard about up in uh, more central Indiana in Liston, kind of just northwest of Indy, I believe, that has a lot of native stuff. And then some of these places, uh, Heartland Restoration is, I believe, mostly a wholesale nursery, but I believe they do some retail sales a couple times a year. Same thing with Cardinal Nursery, which is in northern Indiana. Both uh, native plant nurseries, local genotype stuff, and then drop seed, uh, native plant nursery in Goshen, Kentucky. So just a couple of places to, to look at. If you, if you go check out that list on the Native Plant Society uh, webpage, there's a, a lot bigger list and they have actually a map you can look at and see what's close to you. Um, but if you kind of keep your ear to the ground, ask friends and, and fellow gardeners, they can kind of point you into what they've been, where they've been having luck and who the, who the places they like. Okay, so when you start, you know, trying to pick out your plants, I, I really think there's just basically two big questions as far as I'm concerned. And one is, is it invasive? You should figure that out first. And then is it native to my area? So those, those can be kind of difficult questions to answer if you don't have an extensive knowledge, you know, of the 2,700 plants you find in Indiana plus the thousands you can find in the garden catalog. <clears throat> so what I like to use for, to find out if a plant is invasive. There's an organization called the Indiana Invasive Species Council. And so you don't have to write down the website. You can just Google Indiana Invasive Species Council. You can get to their website and they have a list of plants that are uh, known to be invasive in Indiana. It's a pretty exhaustive list and uh, I trust it pretty well. So you can always check if you're at the garden center, you can pull that up on your phone or get back home and look at it and see if it's on the list. And the other question that can be a little bit harder to answer is because it's a, uh, um, you know, there's a lot bigger li list of plants that are native or, you know, occur throughout the whole nation. To figure out if it's native to Indiana, I like the USDA plants database. Um, there's a picture here on the left-hand side of the screen of a map you can pull up. This one's for a persimmon, uh, the persimmon tree. And basically you, you just type in a species. If, if you wanted to find out whether persimmon was native to Indiana, you could just Google <clears throat> USDA plants persimmon. And it would be right there. You could click on it. It would be first, one of the first couple things. And you can use your cursor to zoom in on a map. Usually when you first click on it, it's just the map of the United States. As you zoom in, you can see what counties it's in. It's really helpful. And then it'll have an N. Um, It'll be green if it's native, and then if it's an introduced species, it'll be colored blue, and you can see where it occurs or has been reported in the state. And it's not going to be accurate down to the exact county, you know, necessarily where you live, <clears throat> but you can get a good idea. So when you're looking at plants, if you answer those two questions, you know, you can make sure it's not invasive, and you can see whether it's native to the state, so i will get you pointed in the right direction. And then just, I, again, kind of urging you to consider the source, knowing where the seeds are from. Excuse me. Going down to the big box store, 
and you know buying a plant probably won't be local genotype you know and it might be a, a plant from a minnesota prairie instead of a you know northern indiana prairie so <clears throat> if that makes a difference to you just, just know that and the other thing is that a lot of uh, larger nurseries suppliers that supply bigger stores <clears throat> excuse me use neonic or neonicotinoid herbicides that can potentially impact uh, pollinators and other insects in your garden. So basically these are insecticides, um, I guess insecticides, not herbicides, but so they're insecticides that are uh, systemic in the plant. So they basically, instead of just being uh, on the surface of the plant, they actually make the plant poisonous to the insect. So you can ask questions for, uh, of, you know, of your nursery supplier about what kind of uh, products they use. And then one thing you can do when you're planning, just go to, go to places where you know there's, there's native gardens. Um, so this is the, the Turner Garden at the Indiana State Museum. I used to work in this building and walk by this every day. It's a really neat, it's kind of a, kind of more on the unkempt side of a, of a native garden. It's not a, a planned, you know, rigid planting that's, uh, you know, necessarily meticulously weeded and, and tended. Uh, it's wild, but it's growing in the middle of downtown Indianapolis. You can see the skyscrapers in the background. That's kind of neat to, to see that in the middle of a big city. <clears throat> and then I've got another one here. Uh, this is the Afroimison Center, which is the, the headquarters for the Nature Conservancy in Indiana. Another native prairie garden, you know, right smack in the middle of downtown Indianapolis. So uh, definitely a growing a growing trend that we like to see and uh, becoming more and more accepted by, you know, you can see that a lot of uh, big organizations are jumping into this. Okay, so I'll just go through, uh, go through a couple of plants that I really like for native gardening here. I try to, I do want to leave some time for questions at the end, so I'll kind of run through these <clears throat> really fast. Uh, I do really like cardinal flower. Uh, it's a plant that tolerates shade pretty well. It's a, it's a lot of color. It's a really bright um, red that grabs your eye uh, kind of in the middle of summer after all the uh, spring ephemerals are gone. Uh, I really enjoy that one. Good one to mix in there. Celandine poppy is a nice, you know, kind of spring ephemeral. Um, you can see a little woodland phlox here to the left. That's always a nice one too. And that's uh, celandine poppy would be a, a great plant for a shade garden uh, for a spring color. Virginia bluebells are one of my favorite. They um, especially have a, if you have an area with a little bit of moisture, they don't necessarily need it, but they'll spread more if there's some moisture in the ground. They have these neat blooms that turn color uh, as they open and uh, really neat kind of a springtime thing. <clears throat> Wild geraniums are a really nice showy one that tolerate a wide variety of conditions, kind of more a late springtime, uh, super easy to grow, uh, nice blooms and, and usually pretty available in the native plant trade. Bloodroot's another one I really like. It's got that really interesting leaf shape that kind of adds some texture to the garden. Um, if you break the stem off, they're, uh, um, they're in the same family as uh, uh, opium is, the poppy family. So they have colored sap as a, as a characteristic of that family. Not a really long bloom time on those, uh, but they have kind of these alien looking seed pods that are really cool, plus the cool leaf shape. I think they're a neat one to have kind of in the mix. May apples need another kind of neat, neat leaf shape. It gets kind of tall with that <clears throat> umbrella shape. I found those at a lot of plant sales. Um, so plants for prairie and sun. <clears throat> I really like bee balm or some people call it bergamot. This is one that you can find a lot of native ours for in kind of different colors. Um, this one is, is kind of a spreader though. So if you put this in a garden, be prepared to thin it out regularly or uh, 
keep an eye on it. Uh, but again, awesome for pollinators. You'll see all sorts of insects on it and it gets, it gets pretty tall and uh, a big splash of color. Blazing Star is a great prairie plant. <clears throat> we have that growing in the glades and forest openings in southern Indiana, as well as in the prairies up north. So it's kind of different species all throughout the state. A nice long spire, purple flowers. Super easy to grow once you get it established. It tolerates really dry soils. So it's another great one. <clears throat> the ever popular purple cone flower. Um, <clears throat> great, easy to grow. Um, Except for the, uh, there, I forget what there's a there's a disease that's uh, they can get where the, the plants kind of get shrivelly and the the flowers don't turn out right and that can spread between all your plants. Uh, besides for that condition, really easy to grow and um, there's probably a hundred times more purple cone flower now in gardens in Indiana than there ever was kind of in the state itself. It's not not that common of a flower naturally, but it's good to see them everywhere. And then there's a, a really neat variety called pale purple cone flower that has these kind of skinnier petals. They kind of droop down. <clears throat> if, if you ever see those, that's a kind of, it's our rare version of pale uh, purple cone flower in Indiana. It's an interesting um, uh, variety of that. Prairie dock, probably not quite as commonly found, but a great um, kind of summer into late summer blooming plant gets super tall. So if you want something up against a fence or the middle of a big garden, uh, this is a great big splash of color, big, <clears throat> very large uh, basil leaves. And they get, you know, one, one and a half feet long, real wide, really interesting looking. <clears throat> Tolerates really dry soils, doesn't require maintenance. So it's one that I really like for, for full sun. Mountain mints are great in the garden. Again, and easy to grow. You, know, you can take a sprig of it and put it in your tea. It smells good. You can crush it in your fingers and uh, show that to people visiting your house. And they have interesting white flowers. A nice little bit of contrast to the other plants that are around. And then New England aster, if you've got a sunny area and you need some color for fall. <clears throat> Not a lot of things are always blooming in fall. so. New England aster is a good way to kind of fill that in in the garden to have a little bit of touch of color in the, as the leaves are starting to change. I think I mentioned elderberry before. I really love growing elderberry. It's super easy to cultivate from cuttings. Uh, just a little bit of rooting hormone, cut a little piece off with a couple nodes on it and, and you're, you're off. It's super easy. Just put it in a glass of water and or some peat moss with a rooting hormone and, and it'll grow roots and you can stick it in the ground. Uh, the birds love the berries. Uh, you can make jelly, wine out of it. Um, some people, I guess, take the, uh, the flowers, uh, dip them in batter and fry them up. I've never tried that, but uh, fun, easy to grow, large, um, attracts birds, can't go wrong. <coughs> An elderberry will tolerate um, full sun. We were asking about, someone had a question about shrub for the south side of a house. Um, I think maybe that was shade. Um, so if you have a sunny place, uh, elderberry would be great for that. They'll grow in the shade, but they won't flower as much. For a shady spot, redbud would be pretty good. They tolerate quite a bit of shade, as does uh, dogwood. So that would be good for uh, a south-facing part of your yard that has uh, a canopy over it. <clears throat> Most of us are probably familiar with redbud in the springtime. Nice pink flowers before the uh, leaves come out. And then kind of, I don't, seems kind of overlooked to me, but service berry is a great native plant that doesn't have a long bloom time, but it kind of flowers before everything else does. And uh, it's really easy to take care of and uh, spectacular when it is blooming. And then kind of difficult to find evergreen uh, native plants besides for a uh, red cedar, which not everybody likes. So winterberry holly is our, uh, evergreen holly, not to be confused with our deciduous holly. And that's one I've actually seen quite a bit more in the nursery trade lately. So if you're looking for something with year round uh, green color, that might be a good one for you. Wild hydrangea is pretty well known. 
And then I'll go over a couple ground covers real quick here. Try to leave some time for questions. Um, wild, I really like wild ginger for a ground cover. If you buy some of those and it's kind of scattered them throughout, they fill in pretty well. They've got these interesting little uh, three petaled flowers that a lot of people kind of overlook. Um, <clears throat> they have a neat texture and kind of a heart shaped leaf. Uh, it's, it's always kind of difficult to find ground covers, especially for shade and ginger will tolerate quite a bit of of shade, so that's a good one. Virginia creeper, <clears throat> some people don't like it because if you have a lot of sunlight, it, it gets kind of aggressive and if there's disturbance, it'll climb up. Um, it can climb up trees and fences and things like that. It's never bothered me, but <clears throat> it's one to consider anyway, especially for something that vines and can be a little bit of a, a ground cover. And we do have this native uh, Virginia creeper uh, sphinx moth that its only host plant is Virginia creeper. So. That's kind of neat as well. Jacob's Lighter, kind of a spring ephemeral, tolerate shade. And I'll go through these real quick. Just uh, these are pretty well known things that, that we all have probably heard about before the different milkweed, swamp milkweed, uh, pretty popular. Uh, monarchs uh, will use it as a host plant, not quite as much as the regular butterfly weed. Butterfly weed, the monarch, of course. <clears throat> Joe Pie weed. Great plant if you want something that's tall, really going to be eye catching. It's got that kind of a neat pink purple color. You know, it gets super big, super showy, not something you're going to see in every garden that you walk by. Uh, like some sun. Ironweed, kind of the same thing, usually not quite as tall, <clears throat> a little bit more sparse and spindly. <clears throat> but kind of that electric purple color is really, <clears throat> really eye catching. So real quick, here's just a list of uh, <clears throat> books that you might use if you're starting to think about doing native gardening. Um, <clears throat> I will let you guys just kind of look over that and I, I can take questions while you guys look at that slide, if you like. Um, there there was questions. a question posted and I'm gonna mispronounce this word horribly. How can we know for sure whether a plant has had neonicotinoid insecticide used? So the only real way to know is trusting your supplier. Um, that's the only way I know of anyway. Um, you have to know where it's coming from. <clears throat> if you're just going down to the local garden center, you can ask them, you know, if, if they're the grower, they will know. But, but a lot of nurseries, I know when I worked in a nursery, <clears throat> we got plants from you know, 10 different suppliers and you have no idea what, you know, what's been done to the plant. So you just have to go with a grower that you know um, and trust and that, and that someone who doesn't use those. If that's something important to you, you just have to ask the grower the question and, and find out whether they do or not and um, be able to believe them. <laughs> so I think that's really the only, the only way to know. Sometimes, uh, <clears throat> if you, you will notice in nurseries now that it's kind of a hot button topic, you'll see tags in plant pots that say uh, no neonic herbicides used or something like that. Um, so that's, that's that'd be my answer to that question. Um, if anyone was interested in obtaining the PowerPoint that you did tonight, would that be available somewhere? Uh, I, I can make it available. Yeah, we can we can work that out for sure. How would they? Jason, you can just you can send that to me. This is Mary Claire, and I can email it out to people. Okay, let me make a note to myself here. Okay, I will do that. We'll get that okay. done. It's it might be a pretty big file, but uh, we will figure something out. Any more questions? Now's the time to get them into the chat. There's no more questions. Uh, <clears throat> keep on writing in the chat and thinking up questions if you're formulating something, but just to fill in the space here. <clears throat> one thing that I like to do is just browse through field guides and just look at pictures of plants and you know, if you see something that catches your eye, uh, try, to, try to look that up in the native plant trade. It's a good way to get ideas and kind of figure out what the native ranges are in a lot of these things. Uh, ideas on getting rid of weeds. 
for example, Bishop's gout weighed? So uh, I saw a survey where <clears throat> they did, they talked to a bunch of homeowners and they basically found out that weeding is the least favorite chore of everybody in the whole world. <laughs> I've heard people say that it kind of in, introduces a meditative state and things like that, but uh, it just makes me grumpy. Um, but I guess with weeding, you've got, you know, two basic choice or three basic choices. You've got <clears throat> manual removal where you, where you dig it up. Um, <clears throat> you've got a choice where you can kind of smother it, put something over it like plastic or cardboard and leave that on top of, for a while while it uh, degrades. Or you can use some kind of chemical control, uh, some kind of herbicide. And that's just kind of a personal choice that I think each person has to figure out for themselves what they want to do and what fits in with their garden. I, I was I was raised in uh, kind of an organic gardening family my whole life. And then I got this job I have now and I spent most of my time using herbicide to kill invasive species. So I keep, you know, mostly an organic garden at home, but use herbicides a lot at work. So I'm not going to judge anybody. But I guess, yeah, basically, you, if you want to use herbicides, you kind of just have to do a little research on what's good for the plants that you're going to treat. Would a nematoid insecticide just last one year? Nema um, oh, like the neonic herbicides that we're talking about, the insecticides? I don't know. It's spelled N-E-M-O-T-O-I-D. Hmm. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a little confused by the, by the phrasing. I'm not maybe familiar with that, but um, I'm not a um, uh, herbicide or pesticide expert at all. Um, and I, I'm not familiar with that one. So basically with any chemical that you use, um, one good way to find out about it is to look up the label online. So if you just Google the chemical, find out who the manufacturer is, you can go to their website, click on the label, click on the, uh, the hazard sheet for it. And, and the label is basically the law with that chemical. And it'll tell you um, usually how long it remains in the soil. It'll tell you what protective gear you have to wear while you use it, what percentage to use it at. <clears throat> so um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to, I can't really say about that particular chemical, but if, if you're going to use something um, or you're concerned about something, you can just do a little bit of research and the label is probably the best place to look for each chemical. Any suggestions on safe pest control for things like aphids on larger areas? I have used ladybugs. Yeah, a lot of people have a little bit of luck with uh, biocontrol. I guess the trouble with biocontrol is um, our yards usually aren't caged in very well to keep the ladybugs in. Um, <clears throat> in the past, I've used, uh, you know, if you just have a small aphid infestation or something like that, spray them off with a garden hose several times a day. Um, some people use soapy water. Um, I've had pretty good luck with that. It just kind of depends on how bad the infestation is, how much damage they're doing and how much you want them gone. I tend to kind of turn the other cheek and <clears throat> unless they're defoliating a bunch of plants and causing a bunch of trouble, I don't usually do anything myself. But um, uh, yeah, there's different types of, uh, uh, I forget what the names are now, but there's different uh, soaps that basically are surfactants that you can spray on the aphids and um, they're not so much herbicide, but it, it, um, I think it kills the aphids by the, uh, by creating that the soap gets through their, uh, membranes in their body or something like that. And they it, aren't able to survive that, but yeah, again, I'm not a, not much of a plant pest expert. Sorry. Where can I find male and female hollies? Okay. So that's a good question. You, you have to kind of, uh, when you're buying holly, you have to, usually the nursery, um, it depends on the nursery, I guess I'll say. And so sometimes you can buy, uh, they'll say on the label, whether it's male or female, or sometimes you just kind of have to buy several to make sure you're getting, um, you know, playing the odds to get what you want. But um, when I worked at a nursery, we sold, um, you could buy a pot that had you know, a male and a female holly kind of growing together. So you just kind of have to either buy from a grower that, that knows the plants are old enough, they know they've got male and females and they've identified them. <clears throat> or you buy a bunch and hope that you get uh, some female plants so you have the berries. 
Um, what are your thoughts on seeding an area with natives? Seeding is definitely a, a really good way to go, especially you have, if you have a large area um, <clears throat> or you don't want to spend a lot of time <clears throat> uh, putting in plugs, you can kind of, uh, we've done a lot of uh, kind of frost heave seeding where uh, we'll go through a tree plantation and take a native plant mix with a lot of uh, wild rye and, and wildflowers and stuff like that, throw that in, scatter it in in the fall let the, let the seeds frost heave in. And uh, we've had really good luck with that. Um, it depends on the area. If it's, if it's an area that's cultivated, you know, already, um, you don't have to do a lot of prep work, but obviously if you're putting it in on top of fescue or something like that, you'd have to control, um, control that fescue and have a, a good, good starting place, kind of like any other gardening that you would do. In the picture of your two gardens uh, just planted, how long typically should we anticipate plants filling in the beds? Uh, in my experience, usually stuff fills in in a you know couple or three seasons really well. Um, I encourage people to start out what they think looks too thin, you know, a little bit too sparse, and then add stuff as you need it because. Of all the gardens I've looked at and in the landscaping that I've done, I definitely, uh, the, the trend general overall with human nature is to plant too much stuff and then have to thin it out later, is my experience. But yeah, two or three seasons, stuff should be pretty well filled out. What are the rules about digging up a plant roadside? Uh, don't do it unless you have permission, uh, unless it's your property. Um, you know, don't just walk through a, drive through a state park and stop and dig something up. That's uh, it, you have to get the owner's permission, basically. Um, so just because you're on public property doesn't mean you have the right to, to take a plant. Um, so yeah, if you, if you find a roadside plant and you and you want it, um, look up the, the plat book data on the county and, and talk to the person who owns the land before you get out the shovel. It's not just because it's in the right of way of the road, it's still owned by that person. So you have to be careful about that. All right, and then our final question, um, it's two, two questions technically. What's the best way to buy native trees, Arbor Foundation or nursery? Um, <clears throat> I guess it depends on what you're, what you're looking for. Um, the, the place, uh, I guess my personal opinion would be the places that I know that are more local would be the Bologna tree nursery in, in Southern Indiana, or there's a different tree nursery for the DNR in Northern Indiana. That's all local genotype, that's all Indiana stuff. And I believe that's the same with the, the Woody Warehouse. Um, Arbor Foundation, uh, I, I just don't know. I don't know where those plants are from. Um, they could be Midwest, they could be somewhere different. Um, so if it doesn't, if it doesn't matter to you, then you could go with you know anyone that was more convenient for you. If you wanted something that was more local, I would go with the more local sources. What was the name of the nursery for Southern Indiana that you just named? Uh, so the Valonia State Tree Nursery is the um, they have they sell native trees and shrubs that are grown by the state, and then there's a Woody Warehouse, which is I think more up in the Indianapolis area, and they sell again trees and shrubs that are mostly local genotype stuff as well. Okay, well that covers it for questions and it's just a couple minutes after seven. So uh, I don't know if you guys want to, Mary Claire, you have anything you want to say before we I close? I do not, I just want to thank Jason for the presentation and I thank everybody for listening and the Master Gardeners for having the program, we appreciate it.